Hey, what's good self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan. I'm the mind behind Make More Capital and today we're coming at you with a midweek update in the world of cannabis. So before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learned something, please just leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And of course, if you want to learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity, subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos. Then there's plenty of content for you to go back, rewatch and educate yourself with. I've tried to put all the news and facts in one place so that you can watch episodes over time to learn about the evolution of the industry, identify top companies that you keep seeing pop up, and take advantage whenever you're ready. And we're going to start with this update from Brady Cobb. So thank you, Brady, for being the uh, the guiding light for a lot of us cannabis investors. Update politics at its finest again. Republicans want amendments debated, blaming Dems for delaying the must-pass NDAA very late in the year to call it up already, and Dems are crying foul. So SAFE is in the House version. That's what's important for us as investors to remember. It is in the House version and will be in the negotiation between House and Senate on the final version. Stay tuned. So while all of this drama is really just the Senate, which involves Democrats and Republicans trying to agree on the Senate version of the NDAA that they can pass, we were not anticipating SAFE to be added to that Senate version. We know that it's already in the House version, so once the once Congress can get this done and pass the Senate version of the bill, then the House and Senate version will go together into conference where the Senate Armed Services Committee and the House Armed Services Committee will take both the past House version of the NDA and the past Senate version of the NDA, go through them and fix any discrepancies so that they have a matching bill that they can pass to the President's desk. And that's likely when we will see SAFE added into the final version because then it's out of Schumer and Booker's hands. And again, all of the Senate Armed Services Committee and House Armed Services Committee are not all, but a majority of the members in there have a greater incentive to work for their constituents, for their donors, and to get reelected than to appease Schumer and Booker. So just wanted to relay all that, but while time is on our side, it's good that we are seeing more pressure being added to get SAFE put in. As Todd Harrison shares this letter asking SAFE banking to be included in, a final, in the final version of the NDAA. And notice this comes from some powerful U.S. organizations that just want to make sure their economy remains the strongest. And one way we can do this is to legitimize the fastest growing industry in the U.S. because it's about damn time. So I just want to share from this letter. It is sent to Jack Reed and James Einhoff, who are actually the chairman and ranking members of the Senate Armed Services Committee. So these will be the two men responsible for the negotiations in the conference process, along with the House Service Committee and all those members as well. But it's also sent to Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell, who are the majority leader and the minority leader, and then sent to Sherrod Brown and Pat Toomey, who are the chairman of the Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs and ranking member of the Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs. So I'm not going to read it, but the link's below if you want to check it out. But just to highlight, this comes from the American Bankers Association, Council of Insurance Agents and Brokers, Credit Union National Association, National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies, National Bankers Association, United Food and Commercial Workers Union, Wholesale and Specialty Insurance Association, Electronic Transaction Association, National Association of Professional Insurance Agents, American Land and Title Association, Independent Insurance Agents and Brokers of America, Reinsurance Association, Association of America, National Association of Realtors, and Institute of Real Estate Management. So it not only helps the cannabis industry, but it helps all of these industries as well, because they're all going to work together and benefit from legitimizing this industry and making it safer. And so just wanted to share, I did not see any news outlets highlighting that news. However, the only one was Politico Pro. And Todd Harrison shared this, and I'm pretty sure this is the paid version of Politico, so you're not just getting it for free. You have to have the pro version. But this is the only story of a media outlet covering that bankers, realtors, and organized labor are calling on the Senate to pass weed banking bills. So it's just interesting, but we love to see that the pressure is being added. And so just big shout out to, to PMay125 uh, on Twitter for some very timely tweets. Now, I'm just going to share these two first as he's asking us or anyone possible to call Senator Cory Booker's office at the number here and let him know safe banking must pass before there can be any progress at the federal level and he also provides Schumer's number here Schumer's DC office to express support for the Safe Banking Act to remain in the NDAA and if you're thinking well what can I say I would recommend calling and saying hey I want to express my support for passing safe in the NDAA because it keeps Americans safer it saves lives and it stops armed robberies and makes dispensaries it stops making dispensaries a target for armed robberies and assault and at the same time it takes 25 billion dollars in cash off of the street which again makes America safer so those are legitimate reasons you can use to call if you are American I wish I was I so I'd be calling it all the time, but I can't, but it really does make a difference if you put in the effort to do that. So thank you, PMA, for spreading this awareness. And lastly, just going to share this clip. If you've been following along, we know that it's likely the conference process where we can get the small victory, and it's just going to take, you know, the next few weeks to develop. But I did want to share this from uh, Ed Perlmutter, uh, who's a rep out of Colorado, and he's been the OG for the Safe Banking Act, because likely his state was the first to legalize, so he's been seeing the effects of 
the fact that these cannabis businesses are targets for armed robberies and he wants to get this passed. But just I'll play the video. I think there's still a good chance for us getting that passed. There was a lot of enthusiasm when you introduced this, I believe it was a week, two weeks ago, this latest introduction of it. Uh, then that faded and a lot of Wall Street analysts saying that's not going to happen during Biden's first uh, term here. That seems a long way out. Uh, what are the hang ups here? Is it simply uh, the Senate or is there more at play? It's uh, the Senate. Uh, and I'll, you know, we've now passed uh, the Safe Banking Act with big bipartisan support out of the House. Uh, two and a half years ago, uh, when uh, Senator Crapo headed up the banking committee under the Republicans in the Senate, we passed a big bipartisan uh, bill to them and then uh, sat there for two years. Now Democrats are in charge. We sent a big bill, bipartisan vote. Uh, to the Senate back in March. Sherrod Brown is the head of the banking committee. It's been sitting there. Uh, that's why we Sadly. added uh, safe banking to the National Defense Authorization Act. There's a part of it dealing with cartels and foreign money laundering, uh, that kind of stuff. So it's germane to that bill. And we hope that it will stay on there. But we've had resistance from Senator Schumer, Senator Booker, the bad and guys. they would like Idiots. to have a much bigger piece of legislation that, uh, no. you know, decriminalizes, deschedules, taxes, has criminal justice reform. And I support all of that, but I don't think we they do. have the votes for that. That's what and I'm works. pretty sure the votes in the Senate are there for safe banking. In fact, we just had five senators uh, from the Armed Services Committee in the Senate. Uh, Senator Kelly, King, uh, Peters, uh, Rosen and Kramer, uh, Democrats and Republicans, asking the Senate Armed Services Committee to keep safe banking uh, in the National Defense Authorization Bill. So I think there's still a good chance for, uh, for us getting that passed. And thankfully, because Schumer and Booker are not involved in the conference process whatsoever, that's why we still have a chance. So have faith and trust that it will pass. On to this one from Marijuana Moment. Credit unions urge Congress to pass cannabis banking reform through defense bill. So we scroll down, some major associations representing U.S. credit unions are calling on Congress to add cannabis banking reform through must-pass defense legislation. So it's more pressure. We'd love to see it. Which is the latest in a series of requests from lawmakers, stakeholders, and advocates to advance legislation to protect financial institutions and state legal cannabis businesses from being penalized by federal regulators. And just to highlight that this letter comes from the Credit Unions National Association, Defense Credit Union Council, and National Association of Federally Insured Credit Unions signed the letter, which also touches on non-cannabis issues. So just to highlight that it is a different letter than any of the other ones I've covered too. And this is heading to Jack Reed, James Einhoff, and these are the members of the House Armed Services Committee and the Senate Armed Services Committee. These are going to be the ones in conference that actually decide if safe banking passes or not. So just wanted to highlight safe banking, remote online notarization, credit reporting, uh, free rent access for banks. Uh, so they mention a lot of things in there that would benefit from passing safe and why this should be should remain in the NDAA. So just wanted to share that as more pressure is good coming from these powerful organizations. While I just wanted to recap this one for Marijuana Moment as well, uh, Marijuana had unprecedented success in state legislatures in 2021, normal report shows. So just wanted to go over this. As more eyes turn to 2022 legislative sessions, a report from normal that was released on Monday details advocates progress on the cannabis front this year in more than 25 states where over 50 pieces of cannabis reform legislation were enacted. So just to highlight, of course, one of the primary objectives of reform advocates is to comprehensively end prohibition. And to that end, the legislatures of Connecticut, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, and Virginia each legalized cannabis for adult use this year. So let's not forget that these states are all ready to come online, and this is projected to be roughly $10 billion of added total addressable market once these uh, adult use markets launch. And so New Jersey's action came months after voters approved a referendum on the issue during last month's election. While at the same time, Arizona also had voters approve it last election. While Arizona wasted no time launching their adult use market on January 21st, 2021, and as of September, their sales had surpassed 970 million, as I just covered in my previous video. So you can go back to check that if you want. But that highlights that they're already a billion dollar market about 11 months in, and these states haven't even launched their adult use program. So again, if you're investing in this industry, try to think long term like a long term investor as opposed to a short term trader, because the total addressable market is set to already expand. And then we've got states like Florida, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, Ohio, Maryland, 
Texas that are considering legalizing in 2022. Those aren't even, can, people aren't even considering those markets yet, but that will be added on as well. So just think as in time, um, you know, mainstream media outlets might not be covering these victories, but I am because I want to help benefit anyone that's willing to put in the work and do their own research. Because if you live in a state where this is not happening, you might not be aware of it, but that does not mean it is not happening nationwide. And it's only a matter of time until the momentum pushes us over that tipping point. And so this last one from Marijuana Moment, top federal drug official says there's no evidence that occasional cannabis use is harmful for adults. Yeah, obviously, but this is good that we actually have someone who's the head of a large government organization admitting this as well. So National Institute on Drug Abuse uh, Director Nora Volko made the remarks in an interview with 538 that was published on Tuesday. It's notable admission given that the agency has historically gone to great lengths to highlight the potential risks of cannabis consumption. Yet, there is no evidence, to my knowledge, and I've, I've looked at all the data from drugpolicy.org, and I'll actually put that link below this if you want to check it out, that occasional or even consistent cannabis use has harmful effects. I don't know of any scientific scientific evidence of that, Volko said. I don't think it has been evaluated. We need to test this. I do agree. Let's deschedule the plant so we can finally test this. But it's great that someone that is the head of an organization is admitting that there is no evidence because if we want to consider ourselves evidence-based, we better be making our decision off of the evidence and not off of the fear of a lot of politicians that just want to stay in power and keep getting money from their donors that fund them. On to this one from CNBC, opinion piece. Uh, and this one's from Tim Seymour and Brady Cobb. So I'm not going to go through it, but I will invite you to check it out below if you want to read it. And it's likely just going to reiterate what I've been saying through my videos because Brady and Tim have been some of my main sources. But their opinion is that that cannabis stocks could soon get a big legislative jolt if everything plays out and that in the conference process safe gets added in and remains in the NDA and passes. So just wanted to share this here and it is nice that CNBC is willing to to share this story because not many other outlets are on to some states as this one comes from the Office of Medical Cannabis Use from Florida. Um, I mentioned on the weekend that I did not cover this because likely due to Thanksgiving, it wasn't out yet. However, we have gotten it. So just wanted to highlight from the week of November 22nd to the 26th, which was also a short week because of Thanksgiving. There were three store openings, Alt Med in West Melbourne, Green Dragon in West Palm Beach, and Trulieve Bradentown. However, the biggest thing worth noting, Florida increased the qualified patient count to 644,173, up from 639,500, which is an increase of 4,673 patients. So that definitely makes up for the lulls that we've seen in previous weeks. Um, but just to scroll down as well, considering this was a short week from November 19th to the 25th and some dispensaries were closed. Sales do remain strong across the board, which is good to see. So if you're invested in any MSOs in Florida, you can check uh, the progress week after week to see whether their sales are increasing, decreasing, or at least remaining strong um, and maintaining the market share that they have. On to this one from TrueLeaf. As, as TrueLeaf Cannabis Corp issues inaugural environmental, social, and governance report, making it the company's first ESG report outlining efforts to operate with integrity and support long-term sustainability. And as other industries are doing this, because ESG seems like a metric that can measure whether the companies are a net positive for society or a net negative. I think this will just help legitimize the cannabis industry if more MSOs can adopt this more quickly. I'm not sure though, I'm just sharing that opinion of my own. Um, but just to add, as Rivers added, cannabis is a generational opportunity. We know there's still work to do as we advance our sustainability journey, and we are committed to communicating our progress, holding ourselves accountable, and being good corporate stewards to ensure the cannabis industry is safe, inclusive, equitable, and sustainable for generations to come. But at the same time, I think we can already be proud of these MSOs for helping expunge records and doing a lot of work in the communities that they're already investing in. So not to say that they haven't already been doing their, their fair share, um, but it just adds that TrueLeaf is willing to go above and beyond. And if other MSOs will follow with this, I think, again, just helps legitimize the industry. So key takeaways from the ESG report include conducted our inaugural materially assessment, materiality assessment, with an ESG consultant to identify and prioritize key non-financial topics for our business and stakeholders, formed a cross-functional ESG steering committee to collaboratively gather and validate baseline information and plan future initiatives, established ESG targets for 2022 with key activities of reducing our carbon footprint, broadening our diversity, equity, and inclusion activities, activities and establishing a board committee, reviewed TrueLeaves' environmental sustainability approach to community engagement, social responsibility, and corporate governance protocols, discussed DEI initiatives across our company and within our community, Communities and provided case studies to illustrate the reports themed a true leave way. So love to see true leave leading uh, this ESG initiative out of the MSOs. Um, but if you want to see the full report, you can grab that link here. This link will be below. On to this news out of uh, Cureleaf as they report that Fab Five Freddy and Cureleaf expand Be Noble cannabis brand to the New York medical market. So Cureleaf is happy to announce uh, the expansion of its Be Noble partnership into medical dispensary locations in New York. Uh, this expansion is one of the first partnerships of its kind in New York. 
as the New York Cannabis Control Board recently approved Whole Flower as part of its medical cannabis offerings in late October. In collaboration with Fab Five Freddy, New York native, filmmaker, visual artist, and legendary hip-hop pioneer, and Bernard Noble, who spent seven years in prison for possession of two joints worth of cannabis flower, B. Noble is a for-profit, cause-based cannabis brand. A part of Cureleaf's corporate social responsibility program rooted in good, B. Noble is the company's first large-scale brand venture in alignment with its dedicated social equity work. So you can already feel good about investing in these MSOs that are taking initiative to right the past wrongs of the war on drugs, as B. Noble will bring high-quality, black-owned cannabis brand will bring a high quality black owned cannabis brand to the regulated cannabis market in New York while advancing racial and social equity in this industry. And just to add, since rolling out in July 2021, B Noble is now available in 10 states including New York. Patients and consumers in adult use in medical states can now purchase B Noble in Arizona, Colorado, Illinois, Maine, Massachusetts, Maryland, Michigan, Nevada, New York, and Oregon. So they're already storytelling through this brand across the states, which is great because it helps this initiative. And 10% of the proceeds from the sale uh, of each B Noble product will go to Towards local organizations dedicated to advancing social equity and providing opportunities to those directly impacted by the war on drugs. So this is just another creative way of giving back through a brand, through storytelling, uh, and it's just very helpful for myself, who's an entrepreneur, that in the future I would love to start businesses and just seeing how Cure Leaf and True Leaf do creative things to help give back and other MSOs as well. And it really just inspires me as an investor and entrepreneur to think more creatively and get comfortable thinking outside the box. So hopefully it has the same effect on you as you learn about the good that these companies are doing in the communities that they're investing in, even if the federal government doesn't want to acknowledge it. While uh, Dale's report highlights that Jason G. Wild, the executive chairman of TerraSend, is coming back with more insider buying. So just to relay another 188,000 of reported common shares purchased yesterday, or purchased today, and 1.746 million reported yesterday. Uh, and this tweet was made on November 30th. So by our rough math, Jason has purchased roughly 3.7 million in TerraSend stock since November 19th. So either he knows something we don't, or he's just very confident that this company is very undervalued, much like other MSOs. And although we would love to see CEOs of all these MSOs buying as much as they can, they just might not have the cash on hand that Jason G. Wild does, but this does add to my conviction and more confidence that these MSOs are undervalued and that he sees something on the horizon, possibly, that we don't. On to this one from Todd Harrison, just highlighting V8 Capital on U.S. Cannabis. Now, I'm not going to go through this because they don't seem to be as optimistic on the prospects of safe passing, but I do just want to add what I add this one part. At the state level, we project a $10 billion of total addressable market unlocking in 2023 as new adult markets turn on New Jersey, New Mexico, Connecticut, New York, the states that have recently legalized this year, alongside incremental state level reforms, legalization ballot initiatives, additional retail licensure, licensure, and addition of whole flower to medical markets. So just want to add that, that these new markets that will come online that have already legalized and it's just we're waiting for them to launch, that will be another $10 billion of total addressable market just being added on by the fact that, you know, more population is getting access to legal cannabis. And lastly, just wanted to share this from Jesse B. Growing. So thank you, Jesse, for sharing this. So just want to kick it back to Canada with this snippet. Hey, CNBC, great discussion today on Canada's rising GDP. Would love to see some information, though, on how much the Canadian cannabis industry contributed to that growth. Seems like none of our politicians want to talk about it openly, which is very unfortunate because our mainstream media outlets are happy with spewing stories of how this industry has been a failure, how much cannabis has been wasted, and how much jobs have been lost. Yet they don't want to celebrate the victories that the can Canadian cannabis sector contributed $17 billion to Canada's gross domestic product for the year ending July 2020. And in the space of just three years, adult use and medical cannabis contribution to Canada's GDP has grown to rival the dairy industry's 20 billion GDP. So I wonder why they would not want to highlight this, but the best answer I just wanted to highlight goes down to this guy down here. I think they're worried about pissing off alcohol advertisers and likely big pharma advertisers as well. And that's probably the best answer as to why. So a few other state stories for Marijuana Moment. California marijuana businesses seek tax amnesty after spate of robberies in Oakland. And again, this would not happen if safe passed. As members of the cannabis business community in Oakland, California, are calling on state and local officials to provide tax amnesty for numerous cannabis companies who were robbed earlier this month. At a press conference on Monday, the Oakland-based association Supernova Women urged officials to deliver financial relief after more than 25 licensed cannabis businesses were burglarized or robbed during the week of November 15th. So regardless of what the Dems say, they clearly do not want to help social equity entrepreneurs or small businesses. They'd rather crush them and allow big business to take over. So that's why we need to start paying attention and acting as individuals. Specifically, the nonprofit group 
group wants to see a repeal of the state's cannabis cultivation tax and a significant reduction in the excise tax on cannabis products. They say that would help sustain small and minority-owned firms that are facing up to $5 million in losses following the burglaries. All types of licensed cannabis businesses were impacted. Cultivation, manufacturing, distribution and retail, storefront and delivery, Amber Center Executive Director of Supernova Women said at the press conference. The cannabis industry needs tax relief. So again, as much as the Dems want to say that they're for social equity and virtue signal as much as possible, their actions speak the opposite. As Kentucky lawmakers pre-file cannabis legalization bill for 2022 session, this is at least a positive victory again out of a red state where we least expect it, seeing that Kentucky lawmaker, a Kentucky lawmaker I should uh, highlight, announced on Monday that she's pre-filing bills to legalize possession, limited sales, and home cultivation of cannabis for the state uh, in the state for the 2022 session with endorsements of several leading advocacy groups. So just wanted to highlight this. This is nice news to get out of Kentucky. However, it's still early on. So just wanted to share this as we are seeing more progress out of red states. And so last just wanted to share this uh, podcast, the Safe Banking NDA Decision Imminent. It's a most recent podcast with Brady Cobb. Now, I know that Brady's been on so many podcasts and he shared the same thing over and over again, and it's really more of the same. However, if you have your money invested, you likely want to be reassured by his conviction and the answers he provides. And, you know, the fact that he's put his money where his mouth is and is invested, much like I am, much like other MSO investors are in this industry, because we believe that it's time for safe to pass because it's good policy. It's going to save American lives. It's going to get money off the streets. And uh, so if you want to tune in and listen, it's just going to help your conviction uh, and see you see this as a bigger opportunity for America to finally prosper so that we can legitimize the great American growth story. And so if you're already invested, this is the time to practice patience, trust the process and keep stacking cash. so You can keep buying at these discounted valuations. And if you're not invested, this is the right time to go back and watch other videos and plan accordingly. But again, this is not advice. This is just education and you can take advantage if you wish to do so. But that is it for today's episode, folks. I want to thank you so much for tuning in and I really hope you got some value out of it. What did you think of the stories mentioned in today's episode? Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or suggestions and I'd be happy to address them. But besides that, if you enjoyed this or you learned something, please just leave a like on it. Subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos and I will catch you on Sunday for this week in cannabis news. Have a great week, everybody.